Independent Police Complaints Com Association of New Zealand. She conducted an inquiry into the policing of child abuse in New Zealand, and she is also a member of the United Nations Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture. She will bring a wealth of expertise to the role of chairman, and crucially, she will be as removed as possible from the organisations and institutions that might become the focus of the inquiry. I can confirm that I have discussed Justice Goddard's appointment with the Shadow Home Secretary, and I am grateful to the Right Honourable Lady for her constructive comments and bipartisan approach. This House will also remember that I agreed with the Right Honourable Member for Leicester East that the nominated panel chairman would attend a pre-appointment hearing before the Home Affairs Select Committee. This will bring a further transparency to the appointment process, and I can confirm that the chairman of the committee has agreed this will take place on the 11th of February. I have asked the committee to publish its report as soon as possible. I would now like to turn to the form of the inquiry. As I said at the Home Affairs Select Committee on the 15th of December, I am clear that the inquiry should have the power to compel witnesses to give evidence. I also said there were three ways to do this. First, establish a Royal Commission. Second, convert the current inquiry into a statutory inquiry under the 2005 Inquiries Act, subject to consultation with the Chairman once appointed. Or third, to set up a new statutory inquiry under the 2005 Inquiries Act. Having taken in-depth legal advice and having discussed the option with survivors, I have concluded a Royal Commission would not have the same robustness in law as a statutory inquiry. In particular, it would not have the same clarity over its powers to compel witnesses to give evidence. I have decided not to convert the current inquiry, because doing so would not address the concerns of survivors about the degree of transparency in the original appointments process. I have therefore decided upon the third option of establishing a new statutory inquiry with a panel. Mr Speaker, I want to make clear that this is by no means a criticism of the current panel members, who were selected on the basis of their expertise and commitment to getting to the truth about child abuse in this country. The fact that the panel is being dissolved has nothing to do with their ability or integrity, and I want to place on record my gratitude to them for the work they have done so far. I have asked the panel to produce a report on their work so far, which I am sure will provide valuable assistance to the incoming chairman. In order to make sure that the appointment of the new panel is as transparent as possible, I will publish the criteria by which each new member will be selected in the House Library and in full on gov.uk. I hope that original members and the expert adviser to the panel, Professor Alexis Jay, will put themselves forward to be considered against those criteria if they so wish. I can confirm that Ben Emerson QC will remain as counsel to the inquiry. I will wish to discuss the make-up of the new panel with Justice Goddard, but I am clear each member must have the right <laughs> skills and expertise to do the job, satisfy the statutory requirements of impartiality, and must also command the confidence of survivors. So the process is being reset, and that means I will also revisit the terms of reference. In accordance with the Inquiries Act, these will need to be discussed with Justice Goddard, but I want to assure survivors and the House that I have heard the strong call that the inquiry's remit should go back further than the current time limit of 1970. There are, however, good reasons for confining the inquiry's scope to England and Wales. The Hart Inquiry